Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Maniacal Music Musings. I'm your host, Jeremy, as you know, and I'm going slightly mad since I've become orga- Orgasmatron. It's a hard job, you know. Giggity. Don't take offense at my innuendos, please. There's no reason to be so cruel. The show must go on, so headlong I ride the wild wind to go tell you about my co-host. God help us all. In his mysterious ways, he has been mistaken for the fly. But he's even better than the real thing. He was born in a zoo station along many dead embryonic cells. In his altered state, he is always under siege by the CIU and the hitman Delilah. Hear his desperate cry as he's, the subtraction he deals with is his own murder. Chancy motherfucking Grife. Hi. And of course, <laughs> we got him. Yep, we got him. And of course, we are joined by a guest as always to make our shows more entertaining and not just have two madmen going back and forth with each other. And our guest this week, I am very proud to say, is former combat spy, turn host of the Break It Down Show podcast, Pete Turner. How's it going, Pete? Hey, man, it's going great. I, I appreciate coming on your show, and it's just always a pleasure to be on someone else's uh, thing, and that's an honor. So uh, thanks for having me, fellas, and I'm looking forward to it. Of course, of course. And first things first, I'm sure we both like to say thank you for your service. Thanks. Yes. And and I mean, Combat Spy, that's a freaking awesome. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> yeah. When I, saw that, when I saw that, I was like, oh, I want, I want this guy on my show. I want this guy on my show. <laughs> but... And the fact that you came back and did a podcast and not even to yeah. do with anything military per se, he does a music podcast like your favorite musers do. And even nice. has he even does album fights once in a while where it's kind of similar to what we oh, do. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty crazy thing. Do you want me to explain it or? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. We take, we take, uh, so typically what we do is we take two similarly tracked albums. So we'll say two 10 trackers. And we'll line them up like in a boxing match. And so track one versus track one. And you score like a boxing match. So it's a 10-point must. You have three judges. Like the three of us would judge the fight ahead of time. <clears throat> and then, you know, so 10-point must is like the winner of the round gets 10 points. And then the other uh, contestant in the round either gets 10 for a tie or nine for just like, hey, you know, you lost the round then you get nine points. Or eight if there's a knockdown. Or seven if it's like a double knockdown. That's like yesterday versus whatever track seven on quiet rides initial album like just can't keep up with yesterday it's too big of a song and so you just go through the whole list and then um i'll have some other judges uh as our compu box judges to kind of like make sure we're sane and so you kind of compare like you know how out of whack is somebody so someone's like i just really love whatever song it is and uh you know, kind of get a sense for it and we just each have commentary so we go through each round you know down through the list and then at the end you look at the scores and you determine which album was better and and it's amazing because you uh you start to see what album structure how it matters like the cure has enormously long intros and when you go through you're just like oh my god i'm just worn out by these intros and it starts to impact how you receive the song and now like, it's just too much. It's just too much. I'm worn out by these long intros. So there's all kinds of crazy things that happen. Or you have thematic um, the round, like round six will be like these two religious themes. And these two albums were never ever built with the idea that hey, one day we're gonna be, we're gonna go head to head with uh, you know, we were talking about Journey and Jimi Hendrix, you know, we've had them in the ring. Um one of the really interesting ones was actually a 91 uh, 91 fight, it was Nevermind versus Octune Baby. And and uh, and I'll shut up about this after this. But um, one of the things we realized about Octane Baby versus Nevermind, Octane Baby won easily, and and the reason was was you have a professional band at, at the height of its powers versus uh, a band that made this huge cultural change, but really didn't didn't have enough songs. A lot of the songs are from a high school kid's poetry book, and and, and the production value wasn't there, and they just they just got out proed by by an incredible band, and it showed. You like you, you would listen. And you're like, oh my gosh, the production value is bad, you know. And so anyhow, that's what an album fight is, and it's a lot of fun. But I, I dig what you guys are doing. I'll, I'm going to shut up and let you guys run your own show. No, it, I mean I'm stoked. Yeah, I'm honestly stoked to have heard about the show because it's it it sounds like an an awesome premise, 
And it also, yeah. you know, I mean, sounds like a lot of work. It, it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. We slide music clips in there. Oh my god, it's a lot of work. I, oh I yeah, do, but I mean, that was what I was thinking of as the back end. Like, oh man, the point, the Not point gentle. system alone, the point system for all that. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> who's, 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 who's sitting there doing all this math? <laughs> like, oh yeah, the math like, is pretty it. simple. It's it's corralling all the cats and it's the timing and everything. And like when we're really on our game, like when Simmons says, "You know that part of Tom Sawyer when they come in." And Getty Lee drops that thing with his keyboard, and we as they're going, and they imitate it. We try to slide in the actual. Oh, nice! Part yeah, the keyboard. yeah. We can't always do it, but we try to do that, or we'll quiet the show down and let the music talk. And yeah. um, man, and we don't always get to do all that production, but we try to, right? And it's amazing. It's amazing. And and and, and uh, you know, sometimes the the judges. In a, in a good natured way, we'll get a little chippy, and someone will say something, and and uh, there's just some really great moments in there. Nice. All I can say is yeah. my editing skills feel like a noob level right about now, but, <laughs> but it's, it's I, a lot of work. No one's paying me to do this though, so eh, you get what you get. Until then, <laughs> you want to buy me a couple cup of, a couple cups of coffee a month, and yeah, I know we could start working something out here. Right, spend more time editing the episodes. We could do that. We could do that, but. As always on this show, we each bring an album to the table to see basically who has to talk shit about what. Usually it's mere chance to talk more shit about each other's album more than anything, but we'll see how it goes this week as always. I I cannot help it that I need a support group for all of the fucking trash you bring. I cannot help this. Oh, it's equal, buddy. It's equal. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but as always... We start off with our guest albums first because we're nice, courteous people. And <laughs> our guest, Pete, what did you want to bring this week? And why did you why did you want to bring us this show? What was the reasoning behind it? I, I brought Octune Baby, uh, partly because I'm gonna go see you two in the sphere next week. So next Wednesday, a week from basically tomorrow, I'll be I'll be at the sphere watching the show. And I thought that that you know I'm I'm diving back into that album anyhow, just to get my 91 back on and seemed appropriate. So I brought, I brought Octane Baby to the, uh, to the, the maniacal musings. Well, I will, I will say one, you are the first person to ever bring you two to the show. And I mean, I, I know you two, I know their hits that they, they hear in supermarkets and whatnot. So I knew what to expect right away when I saw that CD. I was like, okay, I know what this is going to be. So I gave it a listen today. And honestly, I liked it more than I thought I would. Like, that's the best way I could put it is I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. I, I'm not going to say I loved it. I mean, there are some songs I got put on my like list on Spotify. But um, the whole CD as a whole was okay. I mean, the couple songs I knew on it were, like, of course, the really good ones. As always, that's just the ways with every CD from a band that people know. So, I mean, it's Bono. Uh, the whole political thing with Bono, I'm not going to get into because Bono is a douchebag in real life. <laughs> and he's just not a pleasant person from everything I've seen. But overall, the CD was good. So I, I give it I give it a B minus if I was grading it. So not, I've given Chanty's albums a lot worse, a lot worse. So if I've given Chanty's albums fucking Gs. And that's I had to make that great <laughs> up just for his album. So... But Chansey, what did you think of you two? Um, so like, I'm not gonna lie. I only like two or three of their songs from their older catalog. Outside of that, like, I, I don't, I don't like you two. Um, there's so many things. Like you were talking about going to the sphere. So like, did they jack up the price of the seats? Are they still just a hundred bucks a seat, or oh, are they like more? Yeah, for sure. Fucking <laughs> oh that oh yeah yeah. So like, I I literally just read an article about this today, which like kind of reinvigorated my just vitriolic hatred for fucking Bono and the Edge, like fucking uh, the edge is a super talented player and that's kind of part of why i hate it so much because he's so fucking awesome but he's like i'm the edge of what 
my fucking sanity. Oh my god. But like <laughs> So I did it like they did the numbers, right? And if they would have kept it like it's supposed to be to where every seat's a hundred bucks to see, they would have still made like a mil five because they kept like 90% of the ticket sales or whatever. But I was like, oh, they're going to totally jack up some of those, those seat charts or those seat prices. And based on that, dude, they're walking away with so much money on this. And it's not even a, re- it's not even a Vegas residency. On it, like on, on if they were gonna do anything Vegas, they should have done like a, like a solid at least greatest hits thing, something, not just this specific album, which I'm sure they probably will incorporate stuff in encores, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, sorry, I just kind of realized I've been kind of yelling this whole time. I'm sorry, dude. I just. I just uh, I don't take it personally. It's not you that I don't I'm like. It's fucking all, it, good. it's good. fucking good. Bono. It is fucking Bono. Yeah. But like you know, he's like he's like so feeling. He's guys like I'm so philanthropic. But like he has all this fucking money, and then like you know, Sinead O'Connor like fucking died in this like a very small house and gave like all so much money away. But still, doesn't matter. Sorry, I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anthony, why you why you gotta be so cruel? I'm sorry, dude. I no, you know what? At least I'm honest. All right. At least I wasn't faking it. I expect I expect no less to come from my album, to be honest. But uh <laughs> um I do I, I will say the nice thing I will say about the album is I do get your point about the production quality. Like it, it is a solid, it is a solidly produced album. Um, and like I was saying, even though I hate the fact that he goes by the name, the edge, the edge is a fucking talented guitar player. That's hands down. That's like, he's, yeah. he's not, he may not be on my Mount Rushmore, but he's definitely on the top 50 list for sure. But Having said that, yeah, I've just I've never been able to get into U2 after. I think what it is for me is like they made that money and they weren't really hungry anymore. And it just all turned into this amalgamation of pop and U2. And then they just started making money and just kept making money. And that was pretty much it. Like every music act in the world? Yeah, you could say that, but I mean, like, it's not true. No, no. Didn't the, Rolling Stones, when, didn't the Rolling Stones just do a fucking concert? Didn't Mick Jagger get off his fucking rocking chair and dust his gray, gray ass off? Yeah, and get up his no, I, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying, but my point is, is, like, Sabbath and Dio made a whole lot of money doing Heaven and Hell, but they still, you know, were kicking all of the ass doing it, and they just didn't, they didn't lose that edge. Yeah. A lot of bands go past where they should stop. That's the damn truth. But it's true. You you're not wrong there. There are a lot of bands that should that should stop that just keep going. But I mean let me, I wouldn't let me ask I would, you this though. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube's got YouTube's got an edge, and I'm not trying to be clever with that. They uh, <laughs> they do really though. I mean you're not wrong. If you're if you're going to open up the world's most innovative performance venue. From musicians, you're not putting any other band in there except for you two. They're the one that's big enough, <clears throat> creative enough across all multimedia. They're the ones you're going to put in there. They know how to fill that thing with images and sounds. They're pushing the platform. You know, when they did that um, Innocence and Experience, that whole sideways arena profile with their, with their you know, uh, scrim. I don't know if you guys know about this at all, but they didn't play at <clears throat> one end of the arena. They played the middle of the arena. And then they had all yeah. kinds of innovative, you know, like they're pushing the envelope. You, if you want to see, I don't know, I don't want to pick in any bands, but if you want to see pyrotechnics and the classic, I, I'll, I'll pick on a band that isn't used anymore. I saw Velvet Revolver, and this is a while back in Vegas, right? And it was a pattern, you know, Slash is going to prance like a pony from one side of the stage to the other side of the stage playing the song. Right. right? Here, here comes Scott Weiland, and he's going to go thrust his pelvis to some lady's, you know, face in the first album where he sings Meat Plow, right? Um, we've all seen that over and over and over again. And I'm not saying it's not awesome, but it was 
it's a it's a pattern it's a formula right and and uh i don't think u2 does that they go out and they try to push the bounds so they have an edge and they're a big band and they rethink up things and so do they always nail it yeah no no band does but I don't think you can say they don't have an edge. They push, they push. The edge. This album is them pushing the edge and completely redefining it. And it makes you examine their album, their body of work previous to this. And you go, damn, there's a lot of talent there. And it makes all of their previous albums to make this leap and land it like they did. It's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible body of work up to this point. Like going forward, you can say what you want to say, but when you get to this album, this is this is a canyon. I mean, they completely redefined who they were, what they did. Well, I mean, that's yeah. not that's not an incorrect statement. No, I I say I can't disagree with that statement. That that it was yeah a re, a redefining album for them. Yeah, but I mean, one could call it redefining. Another could call it you know getting back into that steady set of limelight adapting to the times if you will yeah 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 but anyway like i said it's not it's not even it's not even just uh like i just like i said never was a fan of you two except for the yeah. couple three songs and and i don't know it's just it's just the way that they're it's like the way they're done you can you can feel it more. It's more. I guess I'm more into the raw and the gritty. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Ch Chancey likes it raw. We all know this, but <laughs> like, yeah. Well, you know, like, like you can almost feel the pain when he's going into Sunday Bloody Sunday. I mean, it's mm -hmm. that for yeah, me I mean, anyway. That, that's a powerful. That's a powerful song about powerful moments, you know. And uh, you're right. It's it is right. And it's a special song. It's anthemic. You're, you're right about that, 100%. Well, Pete, what were your top five songs of your album? I'm kind of dying to hear this. You know, it's it's uh, it's hard to narrow it down. What moves me, and I think, look, everybody's heard one a zillion times, but I am really interested in how, I'm interested in the relationship aspect of this album as I've grown older, right? You know, and, and you start to look at, songs like so cruel because when you're young and you write this and, and you're you're breaking up with your wife the edge's wife you know and it's, these, some of these songs are kind of you know timely in that time and you realize as an adult like your role in the breakup of your um of your marriage you know and and when they did this in their um in their most recent album that they released you know the, the 40 songs they did and you kind of look back and, and you can say you know said it, you're so cool, like we were so cool, I was so cool. And there's a lot of that in this song when you look at it with older eyes. And I think it just makes it an even better song um, in a lot of ways. So I like that. And I love, look, and these aren't the, just the number one songs, you know, so I think Ultraviolet, Light My Way, it's fantastic. I love the Killers version of it. And I just think this, this album closes with songs that I just, they're so great and they're not even the, you know, these are songs that are like, there's 12 songs in this album. It's a lot of songs. And it just, I think it closes great. So um, I'm really happy with uh, Ultraviolet, Acrobat, Love is Blindness. You know, and, and The Edge talks about the solo in Love is Blindness and how challenging that was for him because he is going through the breakup of his marriage. This is the end of their youth. And there's real power in these songs. You've got you've to gotta be in a place where you can accept it. You probably have to have had gone through this kind of thing or watched your friend go through this thing where the perfection of youth and the possibility of staying together forever is gone and it breaks you, it breaks your girlfriend or breaks your wife, whatever it is. Yeah. See that. So I think those four songs and, you know, um, I'm going to pick one other one. I would say, uh, well, I, I think the fly is great. I think the fly is mm -hmm. still speaking to all of us. You know, it's, it's just, it's a, it continues to be a great song because uh, the fly continues to be right. You know, that, that joker, that's a joker, you know, and he's like, let me just tell you some truths. And uh, we're seeing him in the news every night, you know, and, and I was too immature when this um, album came out to really fully get that. But boy, oh boy, do I get it now. Mm. 
Interesting. Yeah. Well, though this album. I want to say one the... more thing. I want to say one more thing about Love Is Blindness. Oh, of course. What? Sorry, just because I don't want to lose this. I, 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 this is really important to me. Um, in the most recent Great Gatsby, they use Jack Black's version of Love Is Blindness, and it's right then when they. Uh, if you guys know the the movie, there's an accident and it kills someone, and it's got these all seeing oh, yeah. eyes. And uh, it's the perfect song at the perfect time, and it's a perfect part of the song when Jack is screaming it out. Man, what a what an intelligent way to to make that moment even better than what F. Scott Fitzgerald. Like this is this is the producer and the director getting together and using like all these great elements. Like Jack White's version is so like Chancy. It's exactly what you want from that. You know, it's, it's so guttural. It's so real. Yeah, and I'm a I'm a huge fan of Jack White. Yeah, and I don't know if you do, you do you recall that. I don't know if you guys saw Great Gatsby, but imagine how he sings this, and and yeah. then, you know, it's, it's this moment. I'm like, oh my god, that is so smart to pick that. So you take Jack White's version of a great U2 song that's singing about you know this, you know, the love and and death, and here it comes, and then F. Scott Fitzgerald's words look out. I think it's great. So it always reminds me of how powerful that song can be in a different context. Now I'm going to shout out for real. (laughs) No, you're good. You're good. But you're right, though. You're right, though. It did make that scene all the more, all the more compelling. Well, as I was saying, um, this album is, I mean, I I have the least songs of this album out of any of the three albums, but not by much. So my honorable mention I brought to this one was Zoo Station because I thought it was like an interesting opening song. Didn't really know what to expect with the name and kind of what kind of I got. I kind of got a no expectation song because it really didn't it didn't land like enough to be definitive enough to me to really like put in my top five. It's just like okay, this is not bad. I guess I'll put it on the list for now and see what ends up happening. My number five was even better than the real thing because of the guitar. The guitar in that song is amazing. So. And then for number four, I put one. It was at the top of the list at one point, but it got pushed down quite a bit because it's overplayed. I've heard it so many freaking times, and I, it's not even that good a song that I want to hear multiple times. So number three was The Fly. That that funky bass line in it freaking had me hooked. I love that bass line in that. So number two was so cool. Like when you said that, I, I totally agree. Like it's just, I was thinking about past things while I was listening to that song, and I'm just like, Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see I see what they're going for here. I see what they're going for. And then number one, of course, of course, had to be Mysterious Ways because that's mm-hmm. the one song I don't mind hearing over over and over again in the grocery store because it's actually a really catchy, good song. And the guitar in it's amazing, so. But what I'm really curious here, here is Chansey's top five. Uh, my number five was uh mysterious ways uh number four was uh even better than the real thing uh number three was acrobat nice Uh, number two was until the end of the world and uh number one was so cruel yeah so cruel is powerful Very powerful, very powerful. Yeah, even yeah. even if I even if I don't like uh, an artist or something like that, I always make it a point to go through and pick five of them that I, you know, at least can resonate with on some level. Yeah. I just yeah, usually I mean, save these. I usually save these blowups for Jeremy. It just doesn't happen to the guests very often. I kind of feel like a di- I kind of feel like a dick. Uh, no, you don't have to I, I oh, oh, you finally feel like a dick. <laughs> oh yeah, no, only because only like because it's our guest. If it was you, I wouldn't give two shits about it. It'd be fine. <laughs> about time yeah. you fucking got a conscious, you goddamn over. You know what, though, Chancy, it's fine because look, you two deserve some of that stuff. You know, they're fantastically successful, which will always net you people that no matter what you do will hate you, right? And so it's fine to fall into that category. I'm not saying you're in that category, but um and and they are they do come off as pretentious it's like the eagles people hate the eagles forever there's nothing they can do about it and then right and then they do things you know like yeah the other day my friend and i were talking about the eagles and you know 
when they first started Unplugged, Don Henley's like, yeah, um, none of those fuckers, ooh, I'm going to swear a little bit. None of That's those fine. fuckers can, can use any of my songs on any other thing, you know? And it's like, well, you are an asshole, you know? It's so, like, we were right to hate you, <laughs> you know? And, uh, <laughs> people hate the Chili Peppers. I have no idea why, but they can't stand them, you know? And so we we get to have our things, you know? And, and, and look, <clears throat> as, a, as a YouTube person, I love YouTube. They're my favorite band. But um, when you guys talk about like, you know, the philanthropic side, Bono did go in and rub enough backs to make the, the financially powerful world forgive debt in Africa in a way that nobody else could. It makes them the most important band of all time. They, they did enormous things to turn the tide on AIDS in Africa. No one else has done that. And so you have to give them some credit because they have done these things. And I think you guys do, right? But then again, there's Bono, you know, and you're just like, yeah, I just don't like you. And he's like, I get it. You don't like me. But he did go out and he talked George Bush and Trent Lott into doing things that are in no way in their best interest. And I admire him for that. Mm. Well, speaking of AIDS, I think it's time to go to my album. And I know, I know, bad joke, horrible joke, but forgive, that, forgive, my, forgive my innuendo because I brought Queen's innuendo album. <laughs> and because when I got Pete's album, I saw, I'm like, all right, it's you two. I know who this is. I know this band. I don't know who the fuck I want to bring against it, really, because it's kind of a mainstream, almost generic rock band in a way, where like mm -hmm. it's like, I have 5,000 different options of what I can bring against this. It's not unique enough where I can be like, I'm immediately identifying this as a victim of it. Let's go. Or I... Or something I was wrong, just like, okay, this reminds me of this. Like, nah, it's you too. And I have nothing that really reminds me of them 100%. So I'm like, all right, what year did it come out? 91? All right, let's talk about another rock album. It's about 91. And I was like, ooh, since I saw this, I was like, bingo. I'm going with Queen's Innuendo album because it came out in 91. And I fucking love Queen. I love Freddie Mercury. And this was his, this was the last Queen album while Freddie was alive. So, and what you could tell in this album is his last freaking album while he's alive because the songs are very, Lyrically going that way, but that's I mean I, want, I mean I wanted to bring it anyway because my one of my favorite Queen songs is on the album, which we'll get to. But and it's just overall a pretty damn good album. I mean it's better than uh, the sheer heart attack that Chancey brought me to one show. But how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> Stone Cold Crazy is a fucking classic. <laughs> it wasn't ranked that high in the rankings, buddy. When we did the tournament. When we did the queen bracket, that was not that high in the rankings. I'll tell you. I don't think it was in the first part. So, or maybe it was. I don't remember. But it wasn't that high ranking. It definitely wasn't top ten. But and I mean, I actually have never listened to this album all the way through until for this show, because I mean, I've heard a bunch of songs off this album from the bracket and before, but I wanted to listen to it all the way through too. So I was like, all right, screw it. This that's the point of the show is to get me introduced to new music I haven't really listened to. So. Let's go to this album, and I was not disappointed at all. So, I think I and I, I think I finally brought something that Chancey can't fucking bitch about. So, but we'll see, we'll see, because our guest always gets to go first. So, what do you think of the album, Pete? I am, uh, I am not a Queen person at all. Oh. <laughs> so, when you picked Queen, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to play along. I'm going to have positive attitude about it. And look, I don't hate Queen, right? I'm going to be clear about this. I don't think um, and I know. <laughs> and, you and don't hate Queen. Like, you just you just hate Freddie Mercury. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. And, and I've I've thought long and hard about this because I wanted to make sure I had, I because I don't want to just you know smash Queen because that's that's not what I think about them. Um, but I thought long and hard about it. And so, one of the things that I've learned from the album fights about Queen is that they are Titanic, right? When they hit the ball, and I'm using a baseball analogy here, but. They hit at 500 feet. There's no denying that. And, and if they get a good like mid-tempo rocker, they're probably going to crush it. And so they they do really well. I mean, Fat Bottom Girls, that's a great song. You know, like it's just there's no denying that. And I love that version of Queen. Um, I don't love when they get too experimental, uh, when they are like, hey, this toy sounds great. And so they, to me, are overindulgent. And, and there's two other things that... They're Titanic because Freddie Mercury is Titanic. He is so massive that when it's time to be tender and soft, he's not good at that. 
because he's just too big. He can't do it. He's explosive. And uh, and just like that, Brian May is the same way. Like every time it's uh, – I'm, I'm being nice here, right? When Brian May shows up, I'm always like, hi, Brian. I hear you playing the guitar. <laughs> there you are. Jeez, wow, Brian, you're and, – <laughs> but when, when he needs to be big, I'm like, that's Brian May, and I love it, right? But it's just – they're both so present in the songs when it's not the right time. And and they're and the whole band is so indulgent that it's it's like they hit a five hundred foot home run and then they drink a root beer float while they go or do their home run trot. I'm like, it's just so much sometimes, you know, and and that doesn't work for me. And and I think you guys would admit, like sometimes you hear these things, you're like laser beams in this song right now. Okay. Uh. <laughs> hey, 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 you better not be hating on Killer Queen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, they make a lot of interesting choices and they've never met an effect they weren't willing to try and use the shit out of it. So, uh, and it happens in this album. But um, the, uh, look, it's Queen. They're amazing. You know, they're one of the greatest bands ever. They just, they have a very low batting average, but my God, do they crush the ball. You look and go, like, damn. And then they'll absolutely strike out on the next song so they, you know, for me they're very hit and miss but on this on this album there's some great songs i have a feeling you're a type of person who doesn't like the beatles until they came back from india say it again i have a feeling you're the type of person who doesn't like the beatles once they get back from india no 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 that's not true at all no 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 uh, no it's uh <laughs> Queen is a very specific thing. Here's here's a problem with Queen and a lot of bands from their era. They can't leave the damn fader alone. Like, okay, like leave that goddamn thing alone. Not every button needs to be pushed. This album suffers from the fact that that Casio keyboard has a lot of presets on it. And they should leave that shit alone. You know, but they um, they cannot stop pushing fucking buttons. And that overindulgence, and they're so big, you can't tell them no. Stevie Wonder suffers from this sometimes too. It's like Stevie, ease up, lay back, let the song come to you. I'm talking, I'm talking about Stevie Wonder here, but there's there's a point in his career where it's just like no one can tell Stevie no anymore, and and it's it's too much. So there's a lot of too much I, in this album for me. I just actually had a person do the Stevie Wonder bracket as a one on one, and oof, it's it's a tough one. That's one of the brackets that people like lose sleep over when they're doing it. But it's just like. How the fuck do you pick between Stevie Wonder songs or between Prince songs? Yeah, and there's look, there's so many great. I, I'm not knocking Stevie Wonder. I'm just saying that you reach a point where you're so big and you're so talented that you no one can tell you that you're wrong on something. You know, it's like, can you just try it without the tambourine? And does it have to have a fuse box on, or a fuzz box on it? You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get it. It's the whole like put down the cowbell thing, but yeah, 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 yeah I mean, yeah. so so much of a tough words to call that, but. Uh, all right, Chanty, unleash the Kraken. So, like, I, I I'm I am a Queen fan, but like, honestly, I never expected that I would actually bitch about a Queen album. Fucking, <laughs> you literally like this album depressed the ever loving shit out of me because you're literally listening to this motherfucker die the entire time. You're fucking listening to it for fuck's sake. I could hear fucking Sarah McLaughlin singing in the arms of the angels fucking all the time. Every fucking in between every track on this fucking album, I hear her and I see the fucking PETA commercials. For fuck's sake, Jeremy, what the fuck are you doing here? There's other albums from 1991. A million of them. I even found one. Come on. Oh, there are a, said- a couple others I wanted to bring. There was, but. Ha- Having said that, I, I fucking like Queen, so I was able to find five that I could write down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I never listened. I never listened to this album before, so I didn't even know what to expect. I just knew the few songs I knew, and I'm like, that's enough for me to go off of on this one. And we've what was that CD you brought, Chancy? That you instantly regret bringing? Oh yeah, the newest Offspring CD. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was terrible. Yeah, same thing there, buddy. You didn't listen to it ahead of time, and you're just like, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" When you, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could, you guys, sometimes... could, could you guys make it through this album in one sitting, or did you have to break it up? Oh, one sitting. Uh, it's, Queen. it's Freddie Mercury. I could, yeah, I could, I could, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I couldn't. I had to break it up. <laughs> I couldn't do it. No, I mean, I I had to sit through. We we did a, the Queen record. We did the part we did had 34, 36 songs on. So I sat through that 
repeatedly for days because I I couldn't make it. make it through Delilah in one sitting. <laughs> really? All right. I swear to God, I couldn't do it. Well, no. With that being said, I've dropped to my top five. And, <laughs> uh, and I, I had I had two honorable mentions for this album. Not the most honorable mentions I had for a CD in, in this episode, but in Tan Chancy. But number seven for me was Ride the Wild Wind, because it was kind of like the Queen song that I couldn't listen to more than once. But it was like a good I liked the theme of it though. So and number six was I'm going slightly mad because that's the type of Queen song I love. Those ones are, are like whimsical and kind of kind of funny in a way. Like I like the Queen songs like that. Number five was Delilah. You have because no who sense. Because who doesn't like a good Dude, talent? Thank you. Thank you. Finally, finally, someone on the show sees this is what I live with. This is my life. Yeah. Who doesn't like a good ballad? Who doesn't like a good ballad? I love I love my cat. I don't need a talk box to sing with it though. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. You think uh, I'm I'm being a little bit mean right now, so I'll stop. Right. No, no, it's great. It's great. This is this is great. The asshole I work with normally. <laughs> I'm used yeah. to Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, he's used to me, yeah. <laughs> number number four for me was headlong. Because that's another version of a Queen song I kind of like. I mean, Headlong's a, it's a good, it's the theme. With Queen songs for me, a lot of times, it's the theme of the song. And Headlong is a good song. Kind of gets a direction going in this album with that song. Number three is the Hitman. Because that freaking guitar in that song was amazing. Number two was Innuendo. Because I always have loved that song. And it's just kind of like a catchy thing. And then, of course... The reason I picked this fucking album, number one, because it's one of my favorite songs ever, and because it's one of my, in my favorite movies ever, slash favorite musical ever, The Show Must Go On is always number one for me because it's just one of the most beautiful songs ever written. And, I mean, literally the last song on the album, and you could feel like the heartbreak in that song because they know that Freddie's not going to be around for another album at that point. Even if the world didn't know, they knew. And you could hear it, his voice, like him singing along, singing that, like it's, uh, it's heartbreaking, it's depressing, but it's freaking incredible. Like it makes you feel things that you don't normally feel like every day. And when they took it from Moulin Rouge and did it, redid it, and Nicole Kidman and Ewan McGregor did it for that, I mean, that was just gorgeous and gorgeous and gorgeous. So I love that song. I fucking love that song. Love every version of that song. It's just an amazing song. But. What are your top five for Queen Pete? Yeah, um, I, I, because I'm not crazy about all of the songs, I thought I would just kind of give everybody one. I, I think the show must go on is, is fantastic. And and if someone else does it, man, I think they can do a great version of that song. And I agree with you. Uh, other versions of it are great because there's it's it's less Titanic. You don't have to, this needs to be more tender. And Queen doesn't do tender very well. That's what I've realized. So um, that song for sure, awesome. It's great. I did not pick Delilah, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I did pick I'm Going uh, Slightly Mad, uh, mostly because the video is great. And even though Freddie is dying and, and he's got to wear 15 pairs of clothes, he's still the showman. And and that's the Freddie I love. And the guy's like, you know, the show us go on. And I just think it's remarkable. And, this, and the song is catchy enough just to be legitimately good, right? And so that's great. Headlong is... Uh, that's a classic Queen song. You know, you can just put that on the uh, the set, the forever set list for Queen, and no one's ever going to complain. You're not going to skip it. It's just a good song. Uh, I picked um, which which uh, Roger Taylor song did I pick? I did not pick Innuendo because that thing is way too long and has two movements, and I got no time for that. Uh, let's see here. Which oh, that's I think an, that's an Innuendo right there, buddy. <laughs> I, I uh, these are the days of our lives for, for Roger Taylor. I picked that one. <sighs> And uh, what was my last one? Um, I did, I did the, I did the Hitman uh, to give John Deacon a little love. So th those were my songs. But mostly, I wanted to make sure I spread the love around because I actually do like Queen. I just bite-sized pieces, please. Mm. And chance a lot. You're top five. I'm scared to ask. Uh, so number five is the uh, show must go on. Number five. Uh, 
Number four is uh, Headlong. Mm -hmm. uh, number three is The Hitman. Uh -huh. uh, number two is Innuendo. And uh, number one is uh, These Are the Days of Our Lives. So you pick, we have three that are the fucking same. You literally pick my favorite song, which is your least favorite song out of your five. And you pick a song yeah. I can't stand for your number one. Motherfucker. That, Motherfucker. I mean, that makes that kind of makes sense. I mean, it, 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 in, a, in a weird, twisted, user way, it does. It does. Jesus. <laughs> We can't make that shit up, people. We you would think we planned this ahead of time if we didn't though. We don't talk about the albums usually before we get on the show, even because we don't want to hear each other's rage or fury just yet. Save that for the live audience. But all right, well, that concludes two albums. We have a third thing. You might call it an album, you might not, depends on your taste. But we do have a third thing. And that one is going to get brought to us by Chance a lot. Chancey, what is your album? So, basically, I was informed of the two albums that were chosen already, and I was advised that I had to choose an album from 1991. And I was like, oh, okay. So, <clears throat> as it just so happened... I didn't even have to do the, the whole I hit shuffle on my list or whatever. Because there was a song playing that I had been talking with Thea uh, uh, from, you know, the Rock uh, uh, yeah, Rock and Roll Heaven, the, those guys. And I checked that album, and it was from 91. And I was like, sold the man with gray in his hair. And I picked it, and I put it on there. It's uh, Sepultura's Arise. And... I've, I've always been a right? Sepultura. 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 I don't care. It's always it's always gonna be Sepultura. I don't care. I don't even care if it's not the right way to say it. It's always gonna be Sepultura. Yeah, but yeah, Sepultura. <clears throat> um honestly, like I've always been a huge fan of theirs. I like their I like how they changed uh, like their different time sequencing and the way that they play their guitars. The Cavalera brothers, especially like when, when, uh, Se when, uh, Sepultura broke up, uh, and they formed, uh, Oh Jesus. I totally just lost it. Jesus but, uh, podcast, you know that. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus ain't got nothing to do with this place. <laughs> but uh it's just the 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 sound that like it you could tell that the sound clearly came from the brothers cuz they even had like so, so, uh Sepultura still does a, they still tour and they have different members and it just it, it's still great but it just doesn't quite sound the same hey, well Pete, as a guess, what did you think of Chansey's album? Now you know it's his. I uh, I have outgrown um, metal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I am 53, and I listened to this thing, and it took me a couple of seatings to, to get through it. And I look, I pride myself on being able to appreciate most most forms of music. And maybe I'll get there, but my um, you know my entry into metal was Metallica. As I'm a Bay Area kid, and and all of my friends had got into Metallica early and I got there myself and I was like, all right, yeah, I like this. And I just, um, I was just too far off the, the horizon for me. And I, I had left that stuff behind. So it was hard for me to, to find a groove that I could find. It was hard for me to differentiate. I heard the time signatures. And it just, it just, um, it would be great if I was working out, I might be able to, to groove on that, but it's just so busy for me, you know, and you might be able to, Tell like I just like stuff that's stripped back a little bit more, and I um, I don't have anything for this album, fellas. I just uh, I I know that it's good. I, I actually and there are things that I did find that I was like, you know, there are some good things about this album. And it's actually I, I think it's distance co distant cousins with Auction Baby because there's an industrial man machine vibe in this that is definitely in Auction Baby, and maybe that was a thing that somehow. Uh, all these musicians that were feeling on that on that era of music, 
um, maybe there's some kind of kinship there. Maybe maybe they were all at a show or a series of shows that you know that inspired them that are that are related in some way. But those are my thoughts. It's uh, it's you know, I, I know Sepultura. That's how I say it too. Um, yeah, I know this is a great band, and I know that there's a lot of folks that love it. But I'm just not 15, you know. And and um, even like like when I, I I love to dig into the lyrics. These aren't my lyrics. These aren't things that. These aren't things that resonate with me, you know, and and uh, as it was, it was hard. It was it was a good exercise, you know. It's like going out and trying something new, and you're like, no, this is this is not comfortable for me. So I went through it, and I I uh, dig the process of doing that, and I like to make myself uncomfortable, and we definitely accomplished that. But it's not my jam. <laughs> <laughs> at least queen well, I, like, I like queen <laughs> well <sighs> chancy pants let's see i've heard the name sepultura for a long long time now on all the concert announcements and shit i've heard this name never really listened to them before today never knew what they wore i always assumed they were a lot heavier and a lot newer than they are but I was expecting another album where I would have to sit there and, and listen and actually watch the lyrics, understand what they're saying. And I was happily mistaken on that. Thank God. <laughs> but I will say I put it on, started listening to a couple tracks of it. And I'm just like at work, head banging along my desk, like typing along while I'm listening to it. And I'm just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I getting a sense of familiarity here? I'm like, did some, did four friends in Brazil like happen to have a uh, Master of Puppets CD and they decided we could do this and we're going to sound just like them. Oh, oh wow. we're, Bra we're Brazil's Metallica. Let's do it. And bam, Sepulchre was born and they are basically a Metallica sound alike. The, the, the guitar sounds, every note of the guitar, all I'm hearing is the freaking whole Death Magnetic album, which doesn't even make sense because Death Magnetic came out like 20 years later, at least. But it's still like I'm hearing all I'm hearing is Metallica guitar. That's all I'm hearing the whole time. Like I'm hearing freaking just uh, destroy them all in, in one of the songs. I'm hearing destroy them all like guitar riffs, and I'm just like, what? The? Like I mean, it, it was enjoyable as fucking shit. But I mean, because I kind of knew what I got into as soon as I heard a couple of tracks, I'm like, okay, I, I know what this is. I've heard this type of music before, and I enjoy it. I do enjoy it immensely. And I told you, this literally is the album I had the most songs listed for because it's a great album but just it's it seems like a metallica wannabe that's all it is it sounds like a metallica wannabe same way tools and nirvana wannabe dang yeah tools see, and metallica I, wannabe no he said a nirvana wannabe oh that know. makes even less sense but i don't understand that one at all but that's right yeah, this I is the world. I definitely heard Metallica in. similarities, but I didn't think they were a knockoff. Why do you think that they're a knockoff? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I say knockoff, like their time, their time, their time signatures aren't even anywhere near the same. Like, they literally brought the time signatures with them from Brazil. Like, that's South American music. Like every For day, sure. twice on Sunday. Sure. Well, yeah. where where is Metallica? Where was Metallica? And still, Metallica, Metallica is freaking huge. South America. Metallica was fucking huge everywhere. They're, they're, they're literally the only band to have toured every continent. Yeah. And they're from the South Bay, which is in California. So, you know, that infusion, you know, South Bay. I don't know. I mean, I heard a lot of riffs that sounded like very similar to Metallica riffs and Metallica rhythms. Like, I just, that's why I heard. I don't know why. With every song, I can you, hear that. Some degree. You, think, you think everything from the 90s sounds like Bush. So, I mean... <laughs> no, we're dealing with here. Don't even get me started on fucking Bush. Dude. Don't even get me started on fucking Bush. But do the lyrics matter in these songs at all? Yes, I mean no. Yeah, some heavy, of them. I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're, if you're a heavy metal fan and you like the lyrics of heavy metal, then yeah, I mean, like to me, the lyrics that's are vaguely are very important heavy metal because it's emotion, it's raw emotion. That's that's actually one of the main reasons why I like heavy metal is because the the way they do the vocals can often be. A separate instrument in and of itself yeah like you know sometimes there's a band called job for a cowboy and they'll break up words 
down to the syllable, but when you put the lyric all the way to, all the way together, it's this very impactful and meaningful statement yeah. that yeah. that just you know has to be further explored just because of the way that it flows with this the sound of the music kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. And uh on case in point, like uh on this album they actually did the cover of Motorhead's Oga Orgasmatron. Right, right. And uh that's funny. Yeah, and honestly, I, it's one of those situations where I think that the cover is better than the original. It, I, yeah. I fucking, I just fucking love the shit out of that song, and I, it just because yeah. it's so simple. It's just an E, just a basic E chord, and I was literally listening to it while I was going to the show playing Zombies, and I just put Orgasmatron on a loop, and I got to round like twenty five, twenty six before I finally went down. Like mm. I only, I, I, I died. I didn't even, I died once and didn't even make it to get to my perks to get to stay alive because I was just kicking so much ass, just fucking working it with just, I just orgasmatron just blasting it in the fucking headset. Just fucking, it was, I don't know. Uh, mm. I, I honestly, I don't think I'll ever grow out of heavy metal. Yeah. Mostly just, mostly just because of the connectivity that it has with classical music and blues and and just all the other things that really just fucking grabbed a hold of me when i was younger i can appreciate uh, that. yeah that i i don't remember where it was exactly but i there was a, a like a conversation that was had where if people could be brought for like you know all the old composers if they could be brought what genre of music would they like the most and more often than not metal was chosen specifically because of the requirement of precision with speed. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's something to be said for that. It, you know, this album to me, it just felt busy. You know, and I guess I prefer Pantera over Sepultura. You know, but I mean, but, hey, I, I, mean, I, 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 like, I like, I like some Pantera as well. But I mean, I don't think did see it. Did Cowboys from Hell come out in '91? No, 80 something, yeah. I think. No, it was in the 90s. It wasn't in 89. That's for sure. I was going to say, somebody look it up because I know it wasn't yeah. in 89. Uh, but, like, would, when you think about like Pantera, not 90. Dimebag 90. is doing most of the heavy work on being heavy, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so he takes up enough space that there's room to do other things. And it's just, there's a, it's, for me, my point of view is it's a it's too much of a cacophony, and and if I was producing those guys, I'd strip it back and layer it in and figure out when you could stop, right, and then add things by design. And uh, I know that's not what they do, and I'm not their producer, so they're going to tell me to shut up. But no, I, I get I get what you're saying. I get what you're yeah. saying. Just, I, I I still think it would. It, I think personally, it would just take away from the. Uh, but I think that it, I think that if you take any one of those elements away, you would lose that that natural feeling that it had. Sure. Especially with it being one of their one of their older works. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well Chancy, what were your top five for your own album? I actually, I've got. It's technically more than nine, but a lot of them I kind of blended together. Uh, so you're, number nine. You're cool, Jeremy. Did you pull Jeremy? Just, I literally, I think I picked all but one, pretty <laughs> much. You can have uh, my share. <laughs> nice. Number nine for me was Dead Embryonic Cells. Uh, number eight was Under Siege. Uh, seven was Altered State. Uh, six was both the intro and Arise. Because I actually slid it up to where the intro played before Arise, and it's actually kind of cool how it's almost like the intro was a demo for what became the song, and it still kind of flows together in its own little way. Uh, number five for me was both versions of the song Desperate Cry. I love both of the way, like the way they changed it for the secondary version and everything. Uh, number four was infected voice uh number three was murder 
Uh, number two is meaningless movements and absolutely 100% every single time number one off of this album will always be Orgasmatron because it's it's literally just it I, I can't it's, it literally it, it to me it definitely goes on the Mount Rushmore of, of like covers that are better than the original because it, it's just such a rarity for it to happen on such a grand level. Mm. And that was also changed his nickname in college. So, you know, he's got some love for it. But Which is also saying something because, I mean, it's Motorhead. I mean, I love Lemmy and I love Motorhead, but like, mm. that shit was well, epic. Pete, what were your yeah. top five if you got five? I, so I stuck within the uh, the traditional tracks because um, I didn't know uh, how to behave on that. So I just stuck within the nine. And then I picked the shortest tracks because, as I said, this wasn't my kind of jam. <laughs> so I did Infected Voice, and then I did Arise, which I actually thought Arise was good. And look, I don't think this music sucked. Let me make sure I say that out loud to you guys. And uh, Desperate Cry at, came in at 326, and I was down with that because that was fast. Coming in at 440 was uh, Meaningless Moments, and uh, timing in at 446 was Subtraction. And uh, that was good. You know, And, and I did... Um, I did look at the lyrics quite a bit too on these songs and um, I wanted these guys to get laid and go on a couple of dates and maybe lighten up a little bit, <laughs> but they don't do that. So, uh, you know, I couldn't lean on the lyrics either, man. I tried. I tried. That's all right. Yeah. Oh, chancy pants. I feel bad for you, but no, I don't. But for my, see, I have three or more mentions for this. Cause like I said, I actually enjoyed their CD. I was headbanging like a motherfucker to it. Number eight was murder because why not murder? Number seven was dead embryonic cells because that song and the lyrics were freaking amazing. Number six was desperate cry, which started off a lot higher, but got pushed down a lot. Number five was altered state because the guitar in that song, I mean, the rest of these is mainly for the guitar, mainly. Number four was CIU criminals in uniform because that one's for the lyrics too, because that was right. Yeah. Was catchy. And number three was Under Siege, because the freaking guitar mm. of that song is amazing. Number two is Subtraction, because right in the middle of that guitar solo, followed by, like, the drum and guitar jam out, like, it's fucking amazingly bomb. Like, I actually rewinded that part a couple times just to hear it again. And then, of course, number one is Orgasm Tron, which I didn't even know was a fucking cover until you said it. Yeah, like, dude. You know, Motor I, Motorhead. I, I'm not that big a Motorhead fan, but I like that. I like their hits. But... As, as, as I know, Chancey hates covers. I figured that was why it was funny. That, that was my number one. I normally, I, yeah, I normally hate covers because they're just so awful. But, like, this one was fucking right out of the park. Mm. So there you go, fans. We brought you, the wow. Amusers brought you your albums three. Three. 91. We've done a 93 episode. We did a 91 episode. And that's about it so far for years, but. We'll probably hit them all in the next couple of years. I mean, it's all going to happen eventually. <laughs> At some I'm point. Still, I'm still waiting for people to bring us more 60s albums, honestly. But that, that doesn't really happen often. We've had every other decade so far, but 60s and earlier just doesn't happen. I mean, well, wherever the fuck you're... Uh, I was going to say, Sun, 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 House was, uh, Sun House was recorded in 19... I believe it was in the 60s. I don't count that one because I don't want to remember that one. So, but we will be back next week as always with a special guest, Joey B, the head of the Blind Knowledge Network, will be stopping by because he asked to come on, and I ain't gonna say no to the head of the network. So, and he's a chilled out stoner guy, and he's awesome to hang out with. So, we'll definitely be chilling with him next week, and probably getting a little stonerish like usual. <laughs> but Pete. Tell them about your podcast. Tell them where they can find it. Tell them where they can find you. Tell hey, it's the it's the Break It Down Show. Uh, just type in Break It Down Show. It, it it should pop up. It's they've been around for a while. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Pete A. Turner. You can find me on Facebook and you know all the social media places. And uh, yeah, just love to hear from any of you. If you're interested in album fights, you can type in album fight. It should come up. Although YouTube loves to smash my stuff back, but. Uh, there's some really, really amazing fights out there. I'd love to have you guys come do an album fight with me too. And uh, I'm down. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, fellas. 
it it is it is crazy when you're forced because the thing is is i don't like it when you tie and so i'll call you a coward if you do you know like you can have a tie for a fight <laughs> not for a round and i might like, cut that baby in half you have to decide and so yeah uh anyhow so that's the break it down shot i really this is, I, I appreciate you guys doing this and uh and i i just dig it i love people creating things and this was a really good time for me yeah dude i'm super stoked i'm glad you came on definitely yeah. i definitely happy i came across your profile that's for damn sure and thank you we when i create when we when i come up with the idea for this show i want something that hasn't been done before and i think i achieved that to some degree but i mean top five lists have been done of course but i mean the whole aspect of it just kind of put different ideas together and made it work and here we are almost 100 episodes later i believe so and we haven't killed each other yet because we're too far away from each other so <laughs> chancy where can they find your glorious beard of face uh well the scavenger hunt on facebook is still ongoing no one has been successful as of yet this is my actual first name good luck finding me uh on uh instagram and uh TikTok, it's uh the red eye round table and on x it is uh red eye table you ever stop and think maybe there's not looking they may not be. That's cool too. <laughs> I mean, if they're not looking, then that means that I ain't got to worry about it. That's uh, true. Well, you always know you could find both your musers on Facebook as the uncensored, unapologetic, and untamed UQ Podcast Collective Facebook group. And you can find us on X and Instagram as at Juggalo uh -huh. Bastard. You can find us on Tiki Taki as at Juggalo Bastard Podcast. And you can find us on YouTube as Maniacal Music Musing. So fuck YouTube right now. And you can find us streaming live on YouTube as Blind Knowledge Network. Because all knowledge is blind. Until I listen to Spultron, maybe got a little more blind. I don't know. I'm still trying, still trying to see straight. But you'll catch your users next week. And we'll thank Pete one more time for coming on. Because it's been a blast having him on and getting to talk some 90s rock and some 90s metal. But... Until next time, <laughs> your musers are out for the night. <laughs>